So understanding the importance of this standard in days 32, 107 and 109 becomes very important. Like I told you, 32 deals with definitions part. Identification of equity and financial liabilities, defining what is a financial liability, what is an equity instrument, what is a financial asset, all that goes into the aspect of India's 32. While it comes to India's 109, here is the main accounting principles where you talk about recognition, measurement, classification, derecognition, all these accounting con concepts, recognition and measurement concepts are embedded into the concept of India's uh, 109. So that is the fundamental difference. While 107 is a pure disclosure standard and where you only talk about disclosures relating to financial instruments. Now, if you observe what we just see is that in the statement of financial statement, in, in the financial statements drafted as per India's thing, in sorry, as per schedule two, schedule three, you will observe that majority of my assets apart from PPE, investment property and intangible assets, which was covered as per their respective standard, most of the other assets will be covered as per India's 109, except for inventory, which is dealt as per India's two. While if you look at the equity and liabilities part, your significance of India's 109 even further enhances because you find that share capital, all your non-current liabilities and your current liabilities are covered as per India's 109. On the liability side, there are only two items which does not get covered under India's 109, which is provisions. Either you prepare the provision as per India's 19, which we have already seen regarding employee benefits or regarding the provisions created under India's 37. Apart from these two standards, you need to understand that most of the other items are covered under India's 109 and this explains with perspective what is the why is this standard even more important than we actually look at. Clear? Now, let us try to understand how the standard has to be dealt with. This standard has to be dealt with in parts. So therefore, though is this is going to be at least a five hour long session which we are discussing on your financial instruments, we'll have to break down each part separately so that it is easier for you to understand. So I will discuss this part, this entire standard into multiple parts. The first one where I will talk about the definitions on what is a financial instrument, what is a financial asset, what is a financial liability. This is first thing that I will talk about. And I'll also discuss about what is an equity instrument as well. When it comes to financial liability and equity, that is where the confusion starts. So I will start discussing as a second part, the difference or the distinguishment between an equity instrument and a financial liability. That will be my second part of discussion. The third part of discussion is where I will talk about compound financial instrument. That means an instrument where two aspects coexist. These are called as compound financial instruments. First one, the definition. Second one is your equity and financial liability differentiation. And then I'll talk about compound financial instruments. These are significant items into our India's 32 itself. There are other items under India's 32, which I will park it after these three aspects. Now, after the first three aspects, which we have understood the definitions and the significance of identifying a financial liability and equity, then I will jump into the concept of India's 109 where I'll first start with classification. There could be a classification of financial asset, also a classification of financial liability. Once I complete the classification, that is your part four totally, then I will come to part five, where I'll do the recognition and measurement aspect. Then I'll come to part six, where I will talk about derecognition of financial assets and financial liability. So classification, recognition, measurement, derecognition. So that will be a complete holistic view of your entire recording or accounting for financial instruments. So there I am talking about four, five, six, these three items dealing only with India's 109. Then I will come to the aspect of something called as hedge accounting. Remember, there is also something to be discussed as far as the recognition of financial instruments is concerned. So that aspect also has to be dealt with. So total eight aspects so far. Then I'll come to the concept of what is a derivative and what is a hybrid instrument with an embedded derivative in it. So in logical, I will be discussing the standard into nine pieces. 
nine pieces if required i'll make it into 10 so that you understand it better at the end of each piece i'll keep on telling you that this is the first aspect that we discussed and this is as per so and so standard so that should help you in breaking down the standard into small parts even when you revise the standard always revise it in small parts such a big standard if you basically read it at one single stretch nothing will enter your head clear let us start with first of all understanding what is included as far as the standards are concerned when i discuss about 32 109 and 107 107 is a pure disclosure standard i'll move it aside i will concentrate on 32 and 109 32 deals with predominantly three aspects what is the definition what is the bifurcation or the division distinguishment between equity and financial liability? Lastly, offsetting of financial assets and liabilities. This concept of offsetting, we have also covered under NDS 1. So, similar concept of offsetting will appear as far as your NDS 32 is concerned as well. Then I will go into NDS 109, which talks about classification and then the recognition and derecognition, measurement of these items. And finally, into the aspect of hedge accounting. Here, so this is the basic ambits which I will discuss as a part of it. What I did not cover in this past, in this particular slide, but I will be discussing as we move further is derivatives and hybrid instruments, which should also be covered under India's 32. Here, first of all, what is a financial instrument? When I talk about this concept of financial instrument, the first thing one has to understand is a financial instrument is arising from a contract. A financial instrument always arises by a contract. And this contract gives rise to a contractual right to one entity and a contractual obligation to the other entity. Let me take an example. X sold goods to Y at 1000 rupees consideration. The sale transaction is complete. Now what is left out? X, since it has made the sale, has a right to collect 1000 rupees from Y. Think from Y's perspective. Y has an obligation to pay 1000 rupees to X. So therefore, such contract of sale of goods has given rise to a contractual right to collect cash to X and a contractual obligation to deliver cash to Y. This contractual rights are called as financial assets and the others are called as financial liabilities or contractual obligations are called as financial liabilities clear always remember any contract any contract or a financial instrument always gives rise to financial asset to an enterprise and a financial liability to another enterprise but sometimes it may not always be a financial liability to the other enterprise it could also be an equity instrument to the other enterprise. What is this situation which I am talking about? Let's get into this. Let's say I enter into a rental agreement. A rental agreement is a perfect contract, purely a contract. This contract has given rise to two things. A right to receive rent. to the owner or the lesser same way it gives rise to an obligation to pay rent an obligation to pay rent who took this obligation to the less this right to receive rent when I said right to receive cash is basically termed as financial asset.
at the same time my obligation to pay cash is termed as financial liability i already gave you the example of sale of goods so i am giving you a different example here in the form of rental agreement which also gives rise to a financial asset as well as a financial liability but i said sometimes it need not be a financial liability but it could be an equity instrument to the other enterprise let's see that example as well. if let's say i come with a discussion saying that issue of shares for share application money receipt i have issued a prospectus i have collected application money from the investor so in that case as far as the investor is concerned the investor has a right to receive equity instrument of another enterprise a right to receive shares this right to receive share is perfectly an example of financial asset it is an example of financial asset but it also gives rise to an obligation to the enterprise which is the company which collected the share application money so the company which collected share application money has an obligation to issue share it has an obligation to issue shares this obligation to issue shares to the investor from whom i collected the share application money can it be called as a financial liability if i issue shares of my enterprise is it a liability absolutely no if i issued share of my enterprise it cannot be considered as a financial liability but it should be in turn considered as equity it should be forming part of equity share capital of the enterprise so this is exactly what i am saying i said it might give rise to financial asset to another one enterprise and in turn it might either result in a financial liability or sometimes might also result in equity instrument to another enterprise so this is exactly why i said it could either result in financial asset or financial liability to the uh, or financial liability or equity to the other enterprise look at what he said here so therefore a financial instrument gives rise to a financial asset to one enterprise a financial liability or equity instrument to another enterprise that is the first part of discussion that i go around clear now let's move further and understand what are these financial assets one thing i understood that is a financial instrument is a contract it arises due to a contract which is written or oral and gives rise to a financial asset to one enterprise financial liability or equity instrument to another enterprise then what is a financial asset a financial asset can be defined in five different parts first one cash and cash equivalents cash in hand cash in bank any short term securities which can be converted into cash within 60 days as per india 7 this part is a compulsory financial asset such cash can be held in any denomination can be in rupee terms can be in dollar terms whatever it is ultimately it is cash held in form of cash such item should be considered as a financial asset second an equity instrument of another enterprise i hold shares in the uh, shares in infosys i hold shares in reliance i hold shares in tata steel so i am holding the shares of another entity so i hold equity instrument of another entity 
which should be classified as financial asset to my enterprise because it is a pure form of investment clear so investment into equity instrument of another enterprise should be considered as a financial asset cash and cash equivalent first aspect second aspect was equity instrument of another enterprise third one a contractual right to receive cash or a right to receive financial asset now what is this contractual right to receive cash a debtor gives me a contractual right to receive cash a bills receivable gives me a right to receive cash deposits give me a right to collect back the deposit at the end of maturity period right so these are a right to receive cash where i have a right to receive cash for example let's say a rent deposit i paid three months rent as a deposit to the owner the deposit will be refunded back to me immediately at the end of when i vacate the premises so when i vacate the premises i'm going to get it back so that means i have a right to receive that cash back at the end of the lease term so even such kind of lease deposits should also be considered as a right to receive cash therefore should be called as a financial asset clear moving on contract so a contractual right to receive another financial instrument let's say i have an amount receivable from a particular party he said instead of delivering cash i will give you shares of a particular company shares of a particular company are also financial asset so an agreement to basically receive or an arrangement to basically receive an equity instrument of another enterprise can also be considered as a financial asset this falls under the definition of contractual right to receive another financial asset which is not cash clear moving on number 4 contracts for exchange of financial assets and financial liabilities under conditions potentially favorable to the enterprise what is this what is this exchange of financial assets and exchange of financial liabilities under conditions which are potentially favorable to the enterprise let's come across this let's say for example i entered into a contract the contract was between two enterprises x and y x under the part of a contract is agreeing to deliver 100 dollars on 25th of april okay why in return is agreeing to pay a consideration of rupees 7500 let's say this is the contract a contract between x and y where it will deliver 100 dollars on 15 25th of april and has a right to receive cash to the extent of 7500 guys if you look from x's perspective or y's perspective let me come up with this from x's perspective if i write down i'll say he has a right to collect 7500 at the same time he has an obligation to deliver 100 dollars if i write it for y limited he has a right to collect 100 dollars and he has an obligation to pay what is his obligation to pay 7500 rupees so therefore what there is an exchange 
what is the exchange i have a right along with an obligation i have a right along with an obligation so therefore these items are rights are financial assets right to receive cash obligation to deliver cash financial liability financial asset financial liability so each enterprise is exchanging their financial assets and financial liability x is exchanging its dollars for cash in rupees so therefore there is an exchange of financial assets and financial liability now what is this condition of potentially favorable and potentially unfavorable let's say as on 31st of march as on 31st of march balance sheet date if the exchange rate of rupee to dollar is rupee 78 per dollar if i come across the exchange rate on 31st march or balance sheet date as 78 rupees per dollar now you look at this i am delivering 100 dollars which are worth 7800 but i am receiving a cash as a consideration only for 7500 therefore when the dollar rate has increased to 78 then in such cases i can say that it is for x it is potentially unfavorable it is potentially unfavorable to y limited it is potentially favorable why did i use the word potentially why can't i simply use the word favorable or unfavorable i'll tell you this is potentially favorable i use the word potentially favorable potentially unfavorable because i am assessing this on balance sheet date 31st march but when is the assessment going to happen i'll have to assess whether there is an actual gain or loss on the date of settlement of the contract that is 25th april therefore as on 31st march i'll still call it as potentially favorable or potentially unfavorable contract while it comes to 25th april the loss the favorable or unfavorable positions are settled on that day i will remove the word potential clear in a similar instance let's say on 31st march again If exchange rate is rupees seventy four per dollar, X is delivering hundred dollars, which at the rate of seventy four is seven thousand four hundred rupees of worth. He is receiving in turn from Y seven thousand five hundred rupees. In such case, this situation exactly reverses. Today, X is in a potentially favorable situation. For X, it is potentially favorable. And for Y, it is potentially unfavorable. Clear? So, this is what I am saying. So whenever there is an exchange of financial assets and financial liabilities between two entities or when there is a contract for exchange of financial assets and financial liabilities, you will have to assess a situation where it is potentially favorable and potentially unfavorable. If it is potentially favorable, like we have seen in the situation, then it should be considered as a financial asset. Contracts for exchange of financial assets and financial liabilities under a contract which are potentially favorable to the enterprise. So the word potentially favorable is appearing out there. Last point that is point number five under financial assets is irrelevant for us. I'll tell you why. Contracts settled by receiving entities own equity instruments. Contracts settled by receiving my own equity instrument. Now, if you know Companies Act, 
you cannot receive your own equity instrument because it would normally account for the situation as buyback. So a buyback is restricted as per Companies Act, only subjected to certain conditions buyback is possible. Therefore, under a contract, you are not entitled to receive your own equity instruments. So that's why I discussed about part five, saying that you can receive entity's own equity instrument, but I'm saying it is irrelevant because they are, your, your Companies Act in India is restricting you from doing that. Then you might ask, sir, why is it included then? This is an IFRS. It is not just applicable to India, but it is applicable everywhere across the world, except for a very few countries. So US is one big exception out there. But fundamentally, if you look at US is also coming into the ambit of IFRS now. So therefore, you have to be open to ideas where it will be in such a situation that it might be against the law of the land, but it might be included in your standard. If you remember in India's 12, we came across the concept of carrying backward of losses. India's 12 carrying backward of losses is there under the standard, but in under income tax act, you don't have application of such kind of carrying backward of losses. We only know about carrying forward of losses. There are certain countries where there is a concept of carrying backward of losses, not in India. So let us be open to the idea that the standards are applicable to every other country as well. So let us accept that certain paragraphs may not have an application in India because it might be restricted as per some other act. Clear? So financial assets broadly into four categories which are relevant for us. Cash and cash equivalents, equity instrument of another enterprise like I holding shares in Infosys, I holding shares in Reliance, my holding of shares in Tata Steel, so on. Contracts for exchange of financial assets and financial liabilities which are potentially favorable to the enterprise or a contractual right to receive cash or another financial asset. This in total will be my definition of financial asset. Now what is a financial liability? If you go back to the earlier case which I told you, here I said it could be potentially favorable to X, then automatically it will become potentially unfavorable to Y. So whenever the situation of potentially favorable arises, it is a financial asset. But whenever there is an exchange of financial assets and liabilities under conditions which are potentially unfavorable to the enterprise, then it should be classified as a financial liability. Clear? Financial liabilities are contractual obligation to deliver cash or another financial asset, creditors, outstanding expenses, bills payable, salaries payable, contractual obligation to pay cash or deliver cash or instead of cash to deliver another financial asset. Clear? These are financial liability. Contracts for exchange of financial assets and liabilities under conditions which are potentially unfavorable to the enterprise. We have seen the example of X and Y exchanging in a contract. Wherever it is potentially favorable, I'll classify it as financial asset. When it is potentially unfavorable, should be classified as financial liability. Remember, if it is a financial asset to one enterprise, it will automatically become unfavorable to the other enterprise and classified as financial liability. The last one is the most important. Contracts settled by delivery of entity's own equity instruments. Contracts which are settled by delivery of entity's own equity instrument. That part is very important. Park it aside, I'll discuss it. I'll discuss it in detail. But come to equity instrument. Equity instrument is an instrument which evidences residual interest in enterprise. What do you mean by residual interest? What is residual interest first of all? A residual interest means the last interest in the enterprise. After realizing all assets, settling all liabilities, whatever is left out, last is residue. That residue, if I am entitled to receive, then I should be classified as equity instrument. That is a pro rata share in net assets. What is net asset? Asset minus outside liabilities. After settling of all the liabilities with the help of your net assets, the balance of the net assets residue is what the equity instruments are entitled to receive. Clear? And contract settled by delivery of entity's own equity instrument. If you look at this part, contract settled by delivery of entity's own equity instrument, 
this I've included both under financial liabilities as well as equity insurance. So therefore, I have to understand the significance of when does it become a financial liability? When does it become an equity instrument? Whenever there's a contract settled by delivery of entity's own equity instruments. Clear? Yes, guys. So let's look at this concept of contract settled by delivery of entity's own equity instruments. And I'm telling you that these contracts can either be classified as financial liability or as equity instrument. Now you might come up and ask me, is it at the intention of the management? Absolutely no, because it should be as per the terms of the contract that should either be classified as financial liability, financial liability or as equity instrument. Let us understand this concept first. In essence, in essence, if I'm talking about, we apply a test called as fixed for fixed test. We apply a test called as fixed for fixed test. Now, based on this fixed for fixed test, we determine if a contract for settlement of delivery, uh, which is settled by delivery of entities own equity instrument is a financial liability or an equity instrument. What is this fixed for fixed test? Let us understand. I'm talking about contracts which are settled by delivery of entities own equity instruments Contracts which are settled by delivery of entities own equity instrument. Now let's say the contract has two aspects. One is a receiving aspect and other one is a giving aspect, right?
right to receive and obligation to deliver what are you delivering here under this contract i am only delivering entities own equity instrument let's say i have a right to receive in the first example i am giving right to receive rupee 10 lakhs i have an obligation to deliver 10000 shares of my enterprise first type of contract second where i have a right to receive dollars 5000 and i have an obligation to deliver 2000 equity shares of my enterprise number 3 i have a right to receive 10 10 lakhs but my obligation to deliver shares shares based on market price on date of settlement i don't know how many shares i issue but it will depend upon market price of the date of the settlement if market price is 50 10 lakhs divided by 50 market price is 60 10 lakhs divided by 60 that way i keep delivering the shares number four a right to receive five thousand dollars where again my shares are based on market price shares to be issued are based on market price on date of settlement when i talk about such kind of contracts a right to receive 10 lakhs this is a fixed consideration my right to deliver 10000 shares fixed number of shares my right to receive 5000 dollars it depends upon the dollar exchange rate so this is a variable consideration but my obligation to pay 2000 shares is a fixed obligation right to receive 10 lakh rupees fixed right there is no change in the amount the amount is 10 lakhs but the shares which i will issue is based on the market price on date of settlement therefore the number of shares are variable will depend on the market price on the date of settlement five thousand dollars it's a variable consideration because it depends on the exchange rate of dollar and even my shares are also variable so in this way every contract to deliver entities own equity instrument we will have to look at what is the consideration which i am getting and what is my obligation to deliver entities shares if my consideration is fixed for delivering a fixed number of shares then these instruments will be classified as equity instrument this will be classified as equity instrument where i have a variable consideration to receive a fixed number of shares or to deliver a fixed number of shares then it will be classified as financial liability similarly if I have a right to receive 10 lakhs fixed consideration to deliver shares based on the market price at the date of settlement, it will again be classified as financial liability. Where both are variable, it will still be classified as financial liability. So in a simple understanding, I can say, if I have an obligation to deliver fixed number of shares, to receive against a fixed consideration to receive a fixed consideration only in such cases 
those contracts shall be classified as equity instruments in any case either the consideration which i have to receive or the number of shares which i have to deliver are variable that means they depend upon what what is the situation at the time of settlement then they should be classified as financial liability so this is called as fixed for fixed test this test is fundamentally called as fixed for fixed test clear so this is fundamentally what i'm talking about a fixed for fixed test and this fixed for fixed test is applicable whenever the contracts are delivery are are intended to be settled by delivery of entities own equity instrument and if your fixed for fixed test is satisfied then such instrument should be classified as an equity instrument if your fixed for fixed test is not satisfied then it should be classified as a financial liability let's look at something So what did we say? Contract settled by delivery of entities own equity instrument can either be a financial liability or could be classified as financial instruments. It depends on a fixed for fixed test. If the consideration payable under the contract or the number of shares issued for settlement, if either of them is variable, then they have to be classified as financial liability. But if the consideration payable under the contract is fixed, and the number of shares issued on settlement is fixed then it should be classified as equity instrument let's say for suppose i have issued compulsory convertible preference shares to my investor my compulsory convertible preference shares were issued in the year 2020 i received an amount of 1 crore from the investors for which i issued them compulsory convertible preference shares so 1 crore fixed consideration my obligation is to deliver 10,000 equity shares of the enterprise at the end of three years under the CCPS, Compulsory Convertible Preference Shares. In such cases, it is a fixed for fixed test is being satisfied. So though they are, though they are preference shares, I will classify them as equity instruments only. But if I say, I will issue equity shares after three years, at 20% discount based on the market price after 3 years. I don't know what is the market price after 3 years. Whatever is the market price, I will issue those shares at 20% discount. Even that also I don't know. I don't know what is the market price. So what is the 20% discount price? I don't. Therefore, I don't know what is the issue price per share. Therefore, the number of shares which are expected to be received under the contract are variable. In such case, even though I have a fixed consideration, since the consideration under the the number of shares to be issued under the contract are variable it should be classified as a financial liability and this in short is the difference between an equity instrument and a financial liability which is settled with the help of fixed for fixed test if your consideration received under the contract is fixed and it is settled by delivery of fixed number of equity shares then it is an equity instrument if not it is a financial liability clear
Yes, guys, I've given you the example of compulsory convertible preference shares where I told you about identifying it as equity or financial liability it depends upon how the consideration of the contract is received and what is the number of shares being delivered under the contract. But remember, if the shares are not compulsory convertible, but instead they are optionally convertible. It is at the option of the holder. If he wants to receive cash, he will receive. Or if he wants to deliver it in the form of shares, he wants the uh, contract to be settled by delivery of shares, he will receive equity shares. In such cases, in such cases, how do I consider it? Okay, in such cases, should I consider it as equity or should I consider it as financial liability? It is none because it includes both components. It includes an obligation to pay cash if the holder requires it and also it includes a right to convert into equity shares. When both of these coexist in one instrument, then these are called as a compound financial instrument. Their right to receive cash is a financial liability. Their right to receive equity shares on settlement is their right to conversion into equity share on settlement is an equity instrument. So therefore, there could be situations where a one single contract can have both equity and financial liability together. You want more examples? I shall give you. Let's say I am talking about a convertible debt. I have received in the form of a debt and it is convertible into equity shares upon settlement. A debt carries interest, right? So a periodic interest payment is a contractual obligation of the enterprise to pay cash. So such obligation to pay cash of the enterprise should be classified as a financial liability. But their settlement is by converting the debt into equity shares on settlement. So whenever they are converting into equity shares, there could be an equity component which is embedded into it. So therefore, we need to come across situation or we do come across situations where there is a debt as well as an equity component which coexists. So it may not be a straight situation where we look at an equity or a, uh, equity or financial liability, but there can be a situation where, second guys, you come across a compound financial instrument. What is a compound financial instrument? A compound financial instrument is where there is a financial liability and equity which coexists. A perpetual debt with fixed return. What is perpetual debt? No maturity. It will keep on continuing to come. So when there is no maturity, what is your obligation to pay cash? There is no obligation unless and until it arises on liquidation. So to discuss about this instrument, there comes across, we come across a situation called as restriction from classification as financial liability. Your restriction from classification as financial liability are basically divided into four items. First one, puttable financial instruments. What is this puttable? Puttable means there is a right to put back the instrument to the company. The holder has a right to put back. What is a right to put back? Put back means redemption. As simple as that. So, the holder of the instrument has a right to demand redemption from the financial life, from the company. In such cases, where the issuer or the holder is holding a right to put back the instrument, then these are called as puttable financial instrument. They cannot be classified as financial liability. Let's say a company has issued an instrument to you and he said this instrument is for three years. It will be renewed continuously unless the company wants to pay the amount. Unless the company wants to pay the amount. Therefore, the redemption is at the option of the company. Whenever I want to redeem, I will redeem within a span of three years or thereafter. In such cases, they are called as puttable financial instruments and they should not be considered as a financial liability. Such financial liabilities, which are only payable at the time of liquidation, is also a puttable financial instrument. These are contracts which will be settled only at the time of liquidation of the company. Perpetual debt instrument. What is perpetual debt? It is a debt. You have to pay it. But when I will pay it, I will only have an obligation to pay such debt at the time of the liquidation of the company. In such cases, you will have to not classify it as financial liability, but instead they should be classified as 
equity instrument irredeemable preference share classic example irredeemable preference shares also cannot be classified as financial liability because they will also be repaid only upon liquidation of the enterprise financial liabilities payable only on redemption or payable only on liquidation guys not redemption at the time of liquidation of the company should also be classified as equity and should not be classified as financial liability so what am i saying if the company has a right to redeem the instrument when they want it i will redeem the instrument when i wish i wish to redeem the instrument today i will redeem if i don't want to redeem i will keep on carrying forward the instrument then in such cases they are putable financial instruments excluded from the definition of financial liability they have to be classified only as equity instruments such financial liabilities which are payable only at the time of liquidation of the enterprise it is a financial liability sir it is purely debt debt means compulsory payment but when is the payment arising a payment is arising at an uncertain future date which is at the time of liquidation of the enterprise in such cases they should not be classified as financial liability but instead they should be classified as equity instrument with the help of this restriction you come across the situation like this let's say i have a preference share which is irredeemable it should always be classified as equity instrument but if it is redeemable and redeemable after a fixed maturity date or on a specific date it is a financial liability if it is redeemable at the option of the holder of the instrument i hold the instrument i can demand you for liquidation or uh, sorry i can demand you for payment at any point of time then it is a demand liability which should be classified as financial liability but if it is redeemable at the option of the issuer then it is a then it should be called as puttable financial instrument which should be classified as equity instruments with this logic if i go you might come up with a logic saying that sir you cannot issue preference shares beyond 20 years i understand again i am repeating that is the restriction of your companies act in india so do not apply the standard only in india it is globally everywhere the standard should apply therefore do not apply the logics of your indian acts into the standard clear irredeemable preference shares cannot be issued i know perpetual debts cannot be issued i know that is your companies act restriction but the standard is applicable beyond your companies act and therefore should are also discuss about certain events which are not as per your indian companies act or indian income tax act now if i talk about a dividends on these shares dividend on preference shares if they are of cumulative nature that means i have an obligation to pay whether i have sufficient pay sufficient profits or not if i don't have sufficient profits the obligation to pay does not go it only gets transferred to subsequent years so today in the current year i did not make sufficient profits if it is a cumulative dividend i will have an obligation to pay in the subsequent year the next year also loss what you will do i'll carry forward to that next year but my obligation to pay is not zero my obligation to pay continuously keeps on arising in such cases it should be classified as financial liability but my obligation to pay dividend on a non cumulative preference share on a non cumulative preference share in case i don't have a, a sufficient profits to pay the preference dividend or the management does not intend to pay the preference dividend such obligation does not arise therefore the obligation is only arising based on the option of the holder or based on the option of the company therefore since it is at the option of the company to pay such dividend it should be classified as equity instrument it should be classified as equity and not a financial liability applying this principles into compound financial instruments where both equity and financial liability coexist let us observe let's say i have a perpetual debt instrument there is no redemption redemption will only occur at the option of the company or at the time of liquidation of the enterprise purely the case of puttable financial instruments therefore should not be classified as financial liability should be an equity instrument only but they have a fixed returns every year that means i have an obligation to pay the fixed amount of interest every year that below, that amount of fixed interest is a financial liability 
the instrument as such is an equity but the obligation to pay fixed returns is a financial liability redeemable in, uh, instruments with discretionary returns like your non-cumulative preference shares when i talk about the amount of preference dividend is at the discretion of the company equity but they are redeemable after a certain period of time therefore there is a financial liability so redemption is financial liability discretionary returns is equity both combined together in one single instrument should be called as a compound financial instrument instruments which have a fixed return fixed return and an option to convert to the extent of option to convert it is equity to the extent of a fixed return it should be considered as financial liability so again these are classic examples of a financial instrument or sorry a financial instrument where both financial liability and equity aspect coexist whenever we come across these kind of compound financial instruments we will have to separate the financial liability and equity we will have to separate the financial liability and equity this process of separation is called as split accounting this process of separation is called as split accounting let's look at it. let's say for example I have an OCD optionally convertible debentures okay date of issue of these debentures 1st april 2020 okay term or tenure is let's say five years the coupon rate that it carries let's say is about eight percent value of ocds let's say is about a lakh at the end of five years these debenture holders have an option to either receive cash of one lakh or they could convert themselves into equity shares if I say that my effective interest rate EIR is 10%, what is your effective interest rate? Effective interest rate is nothing but the rate in market at which debentures are issued without conversion option without conversion option without an option to convert if the market is issuing debentures at the rate of 10% it should be called as EIR. EIR stands for effective interest rate. The rate at which the debentures can be issued without conversion option is an EIR. Now, let's say I am solving this problem and I am saying since there is an option to convert, it is a compound financial instrument. There is an obligation to pay debenture interest every year and also a liability to pay the debenture interest at the uh, sorry debenture value at the end of the redemption 
that is also a financial liability but there is an option to convert into equity shares such option is an equity instrument if i have to solve this problem i am applying the principles of split accounting what is split accounting split accounting should be applied to to divide the amount of equity instrument from the financial liability how do i divide it remember always in such kind of situations my financial liability should be measured at fair value while your equity part within the instrument should be measured in this way fair value of the instrument fair value of the compound financial instrument minus fair value of financial liability Let's apply the principles of split accounting in this example and try to understand split accounting. First, I am talking about measurement of financial liability. In the instrument, Look at how I calculate. Here, cash outflows, discount factors at effective interest rate, finally, discounted cash flow. Here, one to five, this fellow has a cash outflow which has to be paid to the extent of 8% on 1 lakh, which is 8,000. At the end of 5th year, since it is at the option of the holder of the instrument to demand for cash or to receive equity shares, since it is at the option of the holder, it is not putable instrument, it is a financial liability. So they have a right to collect back cash of 1 lakh at the end of 5th year. Apply discount factors now. Discount factors of 5%, PVF and PVF. Five percent, sorry, uh, effective interest rate is how much? Ten percent. Ten percent for five years, calculate. Answer is 3.79. I am only taking two decimals. If I have to get PVF, This is 0 0.62. Multiply and get the values. 8000 into 3.79 is 30,320. This is 62,000. Total is 92,320. This is the fair value of financial liability. If I have to identify the value of equity in this, equity is equal to what is the fair value of the instrument? 1 lakh minus financial liability is 92,320. Therefore, I'll have to recognize this in equity component at 7,680. This is called as split accounting. Remember, 
instead of taking optionally convertible, if I have changed this to compulsory convertible, if I change it to compulsory convertible, then in such cases, even the last outflow should not be considered. Then in such cases, this last outflow should not be considered. In such cases, if it is a compulsory convertible, uh, convertible debentures, if debentures are compulsory convertible, or CCD, then in such cases, the value of my financial liability and equity will change significantly. Financial liability is equal to and equity is equal to. What is your financial liability then? The last cash flow does not arise. Therefore, it should only be 30,320. Therefore, the entire amount balance of the total should be considered as equity. 1 lakh is the total value of the instrument. So, 9 lakh 680 should be considered as my equity component if the same debentures are considered as compulsory convertible instead of being considered as optionally convertible. Clear? So, the classification even in your financial uh, statements also the equity portion should be classified under other equity. This should be classified under other equity. Within your shareholder funds and this part of financial liability shall be classified under current and non-current. To the extent the payment falls due in next 12 months should be current amount falling due after the next 12 months should be non-current they should be classified as current and non-current liabilities depending on when they fall due clear this is my concept regarding split accounting which is applicable for Compound financial instruments. I have shown you both the situations when it is optionally convertible debentures and also when it is a compulsory convertible debenture. Clear?
So we have seen split accounting where a financial liability and equity will be separated from a compound financial instrument using the process of split accounting. Financial liability should always be measured at its fair value and the difference between the fair value of the instrument and the difference or between the fair value of the financial liability should be classified as equity. Let's come to the same thing. This is split accounting. Whenever I have a compound financial instrument where both equity and financial liability coexist in a single instrument, then I'll have to separate it between equity and financial liability. Financial liability should always be measured at its fair value. What is the fair value of a financial liability? It is the present value of cash flows arising from the instrument discounted at effective interest rate. What is effective interest rate? The rate at which similar instruments can be issued without a debt component in it. Without having a debt component in it, if there is a compound, if there is an instrument issued, the rate at which I would have issued it shall be considered as effective interest rate. Clear? Now, whenever I talk about an equity instrument, an equity portion of that instrument should be the difference between the fair value of the instrument and the fair value of financial liability. Clear? Now, moving ahead from here, sometimes there could be a situation which can emerge where a financial liability can be classified as equity because of change in terms of the contract. It was initially a financial liability, but it has subsequently become an equity instrument or the holder of the instrument has agreed to become equity at a later point of time. Initially, when I issued, it was an equity instrument, but subsequently the holder of the instrument and the company have renegotiated so that they become financial liability. It was initially introduced as compulsory convertible preference share, purely an equity instrument. But subsequently, the person, the holder of the instrument in the company got into an arrangement where the holder has been given an option saying that you can convert yourself into financial liability. So he has converted into financial liability. So instead of compulsory convertible preference share, it became a redeemable preference share. Whenever such event happened, you have to reclassify from a financial liability to equity or from an equity to financial liability. Whenever such reclassification happen, and let's talk about the first reclassification where a financial liability, it was initially a redeemable preference share, but later on the preference share holders have accepted equity shares upon maturity. In such case, the financial liability became equity. In such case, it should always be reclassified at carrying value. So whatever is the carrying value of financial liability, I will take the same carrying value into equity instrument. There is no gain or loss which emerges in the case of this situation where a financial liability converts into equity. Initially, it was an equity instrument. That means it is a compulsory convertible preference share. But now the shareholders and the company have agreed to redeem the preference share after a fixed maturity date. In such cases, it gets classified from an equity instrument to a financial liability. Whenever such classification occurs, I will have to reclassify the equity into financial liability at fair value. So the measurement has changed. It was carrying at as equity instrument on a particular value. But when it came to a financial liability, I have a different value altogether because it should be measured at fair value. That means there is a difference which emerges. That difference is a gain or loss. Such gain or loss should be transferred to other equity. That means it should be included within the reserves of the company itself. This is a very small, tiny concept that goes into reclassification of an equity instrument and a financial liability. And to sum up what we have discussed so far, we have covered aspects of India's 32 only, where under the concepts of India's 32, I have discussed about what is the importance of your financial instrument standard and what is the significant application of this standard in multiple places of your financial statements. Then we went into the definitions of financial instrument, financial asset, financial liability and equity instrument. Then we have seen a fix for fixed test to differentiate between a financial liability and equity when I have a contract which can be settled in entity's own equity instrument. So we have seen a fixed for fixed test there. Then we came across certain exemptions for instruments which should not be classified as a financial liability. Puttable financial instruments where the company has a right to redeem the instrument 
at any uncertain future event or an uh, any uncertain future date or the instrument is only redeemable upon liquidation of the company there is no fixed maturity date in such situation they cannot be classified as financial liability they should only be classified as equity instrument that was a fourth aspect which i covered as exemptions or exceptions from being classified as financial liability the last one what i spoke about is about compound financial instruments where i apply split accounting to identify the concept of financial liability and equity which coexist in one single compound instrument lastly i was talking about reclassification of financial liability and equity instruments when they get reclassified from equity to financial liability or e uh, financial liability to equity and that will bring us to the end of discussion to a part of india's 32 to a part because under india's 32 we also have certain other aspects like offsetting your financial assets and financial liabilities and also we have a discussion regarding hybrid instruments and embedded derivatives i will park these two towards the end so i will give a full stop to india's 32 here or a comma to india's 32 here i will continue india's 32 at a later point of time now i'll have to get into the aspect of india's 109 where i discuss about the classification recognition measurement derecognition and the concepts of hedge accounting clear